1969. He earned his undergraduate degree at Oxford in 1962 and remained there to study under Nico Tinbergen, an eminent Danish biologist and Nobel Prize winner. He received his doctorate in 1966 and accepted a position as an assistant professor of zoology at the University of California at Berkeley, where he taught until 1969. He returned to Oxford in 1970 as a lecturer in zoology and a fellow of New College. He was awarded the newly endowed position as the Charles Simone Chair of Public Understandings of Science, where he remains currently. Building on the ideas of Tinbergen, the first modern ethologist, Dr. Dawkins studied the nature of animal behavior, concentrating on the differences between animal instinct and learned behavior, cooperation and competition, and group and individual behavior. However, as early as 1965, his focus expanded into evolutionary biology. Applying ethological theories of behavior, he hit on the unique concept that the gene, not the individual species or society, was the prime unit of evolution. This theory led to his whole, uh, his whole theory about the meme, which he has brought to him so much recognition as well as controversy. And at this point in Dr. Dawkins' biography, my tiny blonde brain with the five cells exploded because I will tell you the concepts are so mind expanding to say the least. So at this point in time, I am going to turn the program over to Dr. Dawkins and Sally Quinn so they can accurately and intelligently describe his lifelong work to you. Uh, 
I'm just going to name a few things uh, that we have in common, and uh, we'll also give the audience a little peek at what's inside your book, and there's a lot more too. First of all, we're exactly the same age. Um, secondly, our parents married the same year. Um, we both grew up traveling. Your father was in the British government working for um, agriculture. My father was in the military. He went to many different schools. I went to many different schools. Um, <clears throat> we were both atheists. I became an atheist at age five, so I beat you. <laughs> <laughs> Richard became an atheist, I think, at 17. As my friend said. Um, we both went to boarding school, and where we were both broke. <laughs> he went to Oxford, uh, I went to Smith College. Um, Richard was a, an Elvis Presley freak, and I was an Elvis Presley freak. And Richard has one thing we don't have in common, is he has a beautiful singing voice, and I was exempt from mandatory glee club. <laughs> so, but at the end of this interview, Richard and I are going to sing an Elvis song for you. <laughs> I, I, I haven't broken it. I mean, he just, this is the first he's just learned of it. Um, <clears throat> Richard had a wonderful mentor, Nico Tinbergen. I had Dennis Johnston, who was a famous Irish playwright. Um, his, his parents were married 70 years, and I were married for 60 years. Um, Richard wrote a book about religion. Um, I started a religion website. We both had very happy childhoods. Um, we both lost our virginity at the same age. Altogether. <laughs> 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 Richard was a, lo a little older than, I mean, a little younger than I was, which is the way it probably should be. Um, he wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a movie star. and. Um, majored in theater at Smith, and he, he actually became a movie star. Um, we both became writers. Um, both of us loved and reread many times Gone with the Wind. We both refused to take a trip on LSD. Um, we both are emotional saps. Richard cries at sad songs, and also when he reads beautiful poetry. Um, we both liked the Christmas holidays. You once told me that you liked to enjoy the Christmas holidays. Um, we're both superstitious. Richard once told me that he would not sleep alone in a haunted house. Um, both of us were anti-war, very anti-war, uh, and demonstrated against the war in Vietnam. Both of us worked for Senator Eugene McCarthy. Both of us became writers. Um, he beat me to his memoir. This is, by the way, part one of his memoir. Uh, and he has two more years, uh, isn't that right? And part two will come out, and I just signed a contract to do my memoir, and it's due in two years, so we'll see who beats whom. Anyway, I thought that was a pretty amazing um, number of coincidences, and, and I thought it also gave you an insight into a Richard Dawkins, those little items that most people don't know about. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that I wanted to ask you first is, what took you so long to become an atheist? Because when you were 13, you were pretty religious. Well, I did become an atheist.
Only because the living world is so wonderful, and so complex, and so beautiful. So why, why, why did you give it up? I mean, was there a moment where you said, this is all nonsense, I can't believe in it? Yes. Um, <coughs> I, I, gave, I gave it up. Um, really, when I understood about Darwinian evolution, that I um, had lost the last vestige of reason, and you were never present, or could have created it. Yet. The Elvis Presley thing came up because I, I discovered that Elvis had, had done a, a religious album called Peace and Valley. This is what we're going to sing later to you. This excited me very much because it, for some reason it, I was surprised that Elvis was religious. How could Elvis not have been religious and think about it? And he came from the South and he was very educated and so on. Um, so, <laughs> religion fails to answer that science answers. The deep questions of existence, by that I mean questions like, well, above all, why are we so complicated? Why are we things? Why do we things carry this huge appearance of having been desired? Look at them being desired. Where did that come from? How did life start? How did the universe start? Why are we here? What's the purpose of life? Um, these are all what I call the deep questions. And these are the kinds of questions. And then um, failed. But, but yes. has any, I mean, is there any answer to any of these questions? I mean, no. Yes. I mean, because you said that one of the things you said in your book, and I don't remember the exact quote, was something to the effect of, you know, one of the saddest things is people who are, accept the idea that they can't understand it, will never understand it. It's quite exciting. 
exciting to think that there are lots of things yet to understand. But privileged as we are to live in the 21st century, we, we live after a lot of exciting enterprise, and we live at a time when a great deal is understood about those questions. We certainly understand why the new things look bizarre. We understand why they're so complicated, so beautiful, so elegant. Uh, we don't yet know exactly how life started, but we understand in principle the kind of thing it had to have been. And it's not mysterious, it's, uh, it's something that has a naturalistic explanation which one may be made to discover. And the origin of the universe, uh, I think physicists have got it back to the last tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. We don't know quite what happened to the or caused the Big Bang, or we believe the word caused the Big Bang. But everything else after that is physicists have got pretty well taken. And so um, we do have an enormously large handle on those deep and important questions which religion has inspired to answer. Science has now answered, or is in the process of answering. Some of it until you get to the Big Bang. Um, as you once said, if there's a creator, who created the creator. So, mm -hmm. how did the bangs? Well, you'd have to ask this is that. Um, <laughs> but my, my colleague, Lawrence Krauss, who might have taught a film called The Young Believers, uh, has written a book called The Universe of Nothing. And he has uh, physical reasons, physicist reasons, for thinking that the universe started from literally nothing. I'd always rather suppose the universe started from something like Certainly, something complex, something rather simple. Right, right. Oh, um, well, it, it's not very really relevant, like what, because it's been superseded by the nothing. You all are kidding. And I, I think you would have to ask this. Let, let Lawrence ask it. He's got that in the mind. So, one of the things that, I mean, first you're talking about biology. So many people are people who have given up their faith and then gone back to it. Um, my son was telling me today about a, a, a hard metal rocker who um, was on drugs and all of that and then discovered Jesus and suddenly came back to his faith and, and he was a person who had faith. So, I mean, you can't really ascribe it all to what religion you've been brought up in. No, there are exceptions, of course. I, I didn't have my parents not religious. Um, I went to religious schools. It's quite difficult not to in, 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 in the I didn't have my childhood. Um, you just went to church and went to school. That was that. Um, as you say, there are some people who come up and come back to the other side. The great majority of people in the world follow the religion. 
people, the majority of people in the world, who want and need something to believe in that's bigger than themselves. From a scientific point of view, what, how do you explain that? Well, uh, if you want to put it psychologically, yeah. why would people want to believe in something bigger than themselves? Um, if you are a wishful thinker and say you're afraid, perhaps afraid of dying, perhaps you want to meet a loved one in another world, uh, perhaps you feel inadequate to meet um, as a kind of father figure or mother figure to look up to, um, it's easy to see why uh, people might have a psychological need for such kind of religion. Um, what's not so easy for me to see is why having a psychological need translates to something to be in the truth of something. It may be very comfortable survive your own day. But the fact that X is comforting doesn't make X true. Uh, and uh, I think it takes that not a very big ability to see that what just because you want something to be true, that doesn't make it true. Um, so that's not to me a very satisfying condition, but it does seem to work for some people or something that really do seem to be governed by what they want to be true. I prefer a kind of Darwinian explanation where I ask the question, what is it about the human brain, the human mind, which leads people to do this? And I don't think, I mean, usually Darwinians might look for a survival value in everything that an animal does. Uh, my mentor, Peter Tinder, devoted much of his life to study the survival value of animal behavior. By the way, he was Dutch, not Danish. Um, the, the idea that he was Danish crept into some article a few years ago that's been repeated again and again and again. Um, rather interesting news than me. Anyway, he would, he would look at an animal, animal's behavior, and if, if it was widespread in the species, he would say it must have survival value. How does it contribute to the survival of the animal or its genes? Religion is a human universal in the sense that all cultures have it. Not all individuals have it, but all cultures as found by the so it looks as though it's the kind of thing that ought to have done in its survival now. Um, another way to put this is that it may not be religion itself that has survival now, but some kind of psychological predisposition which does have survival now, or does have survival now in our wild ancestors on the African plains, which incidentally has the consequence of making people who live under the right condition. The kind of thing I'm thinking of there a tendency to believe your parents when they tell you something very serious. Uh, if you imagine a child of a paid person being told very seriously, don't pick up snakes, don't go near the cliff edge, don't bathe in the river when the water comes. These are very important things to believe. A child brain had better not be too experimental, better not be too sceptical. Otherwise, it's going to end up inside a problem. Um, so the child brain comes into the world pre-programmed to believe whatever its parents tell it. But if you're pre-programmed to believe whatever your parents tell you, it's not obvious which is the good advice, like don't pay the you know, don't go to the river. And bad advice, like um, it's essential <coughs> to um, sacrifice a goat at the time of the full moon or the crops. You can't tell the difference. By definition, you can't tell the difference because you come into the world naive and you believe whatever you're told. So because the child brain is predisposed to believe whatever it's told, it is vulnerable to parasitism by equivalent of computer viruses, by mind viruses. So once the idea gets into people's heads that you have to pray to them at night time to gain whatever it is, it gets passed down to generations it's very difficult to break that cycle. So I would say that we probably shouldn't be looking for a survival value of religion per se. We're looking for a survival value of a psychological predisposition, which has the effect of making people religious under the right cultural conditions. Do you think that there was ever a point um, in early man, in the life of early man, where religion for some sort of spirituality or some superstition. Well, I certainly think that the psychological predisposition to it, as to whether religion itself did, uh, possibly, I mean, 
evidence, it's not very strong evidence, there's some weak evidence that, uh, that religious people suffer less from distress diseases. Things like, um, I suppose, Alzheimer's um, Perhaps because they feel more at peace, more at ease, uh, less fear, something like that. It wouldn't be totally surprising if that were true, although the evidence, as I say, is not good. Um, if that were true, that might that might have provided a kind of um, weak selection pressure in favor of religion. I doubt if that, that's the main reason. Do you, um, do you think that over the years your view of religion has changed? You said you were a you know, militant atheist uh, when you were in college, and that obviously when you wrote the God Delusion,